We're going to be in Acts chapter 13, if you want to turn there. Um, I know, so rude to check my phone during church, but I want to make sure it's on silent. And I want to see, um, for you, those of you that are on the prayer vine, know that Nick Higgins went back to the hospital early this morning due to abdominal and kidney pain. Um, they did a CT scan. His abdomen and kidneys are fine, but his lymph nodes have actually grown in size since last time. So continued testing and continued prayer for our brother. Let's pray for that first. Father, we are uh, so grateful that you hear us, Lord. So grateful that you care. So grateful that you know all the things that we don't know, Lord, and know that we can trust you with them. Know that you love our brother even more than we possibly could. Uh, we ask for wisdom and um, supernatural whatever it takes from these doctors, Lord, healing from you. Um, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to us today here. Encourage us. Build us up. Strengthen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn my gain down. It's echoing like crazy up here. Okay. I don't know what you did, but your hand's nowhere near the gain, so that's amazing. Okay. All right. Good. Acts chapter 13. Uh, if you will, though, turn back a couple pages. Turn me up just this a fraction so I can hear me. Perf uh, yeah, a, B, C. That's pretty good. Acts chapter 1. You think you guys are confused by this. This is going on up here all the time. Acts chapter 1. Just because there's this huge transition in Acts chapter 13. But I want you to see why. I want you to see that it was part of God's plan all the way along. Um, but back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Actually, you know what? I think it's timely and appropriate that we go to verse 7. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. You guys get what that means? It's not for you to know that. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know why now. I don't know. I, I don't understand your plan. Well, guess what? You're not supposed to, apparently. Verse 7 says again, And he said to them, It is not for you. It's not your business to know times or seasons, which the Father has put on his own authority. But verse 8 was my intent that we see this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, even to Old Town, even to Greenbush. You know, up until this part in the, in the book of Acts, we've seen ministry happen in Jerusalem, right? The early church pretty much camped out in Jerusalem, and people came to Jerusalem. And, and stayed there. And then we saw some spread in Judea and into Samaria and just a little bit outside of that. But it wasn't with a heart and intent of doing a missionary journey or short-term mission trips, going out and spreading the gospel to these areas. It, or God send me. It was more the result of persecution, right? The, the theme was more run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm Whatever. Gingerbread man? It doesn't even... I'm so tired. <laughs> but God does something incredible in Acts chapter 13. And that all changes. And so go ahead and turn there. And in verse 1 it says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, so they had spread that far, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
what, what a diverse group. And this is really a study in and of itself to go through these guys. Let me just read two more verses, and then we'll come back to that. Because verse 2 says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So back to verse 1. In a certain church that was in Antioch. So the church there had grown. If you don't have a Bible, um, you're able and welcome to follow along on the screens. But we want you to slip a hand up because we want you to see it in front of your face. So you see it on the page and get into that practice of, of reading the word. So if you don't have one, put a hand up and Ron will get you one. But this church was gathered and, and there was, who was there? Certain what? Prophets. Certain prophets were there. And certain teachers were there. So we see this demonstration of different gifts, even in the early church. Those that had the gift of prophecy, speaking forth the word of God. And those that were teachers, sometimes we think of that as the same thing. And really there's a distinction between the gifts. Those that would expound on and those that would um, teach and instruct in the word of God. And then you've got this guy Barnabas that we know was an incredible encourager. The church is such a need of Barnabases today. And then Simeon, who was called Niger, um, probably the same Simeon that carried the cross of Christ. Okay, Niger, when you look at the term, it actually means black, and there's some indication that he may have been that Simon of Serene and in that area from uh, Africa. Lucius would probably, potentially, was a, a convert that the Lord used Simeon to, to um, teach about Jesus. He also was from Serene. Uh, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch. This, uh, this was Herod Antipas. So the same Herod that killed John the Baptist. The same Herod that sat over one of the trials of Jesus. And then you've got this guy that it said he'd been brought up with him. And the language indicates that almost like a foster child, may have even been in the same home, but grew up together. And what an extreme difference in the outcome of their lives. You know, one chose wickedness and evil, and one chose Jesus, and, and now is instrumental in this powerful church in Antioch. We don't just see that among buddies. Some of you guys, my, I myself can think of my friends that I grew up with. Some are dead. Some are in prison. Some are all over the place. And then some have become pastors and are serving the Lord. It's just incredible. But we see that even within families, you know, the choices and influences in people's lives. But I just want you to see the diversity of this group that God has brought together. This guy that was brought up with Herod. And then there's Saul, and we know the story of Saul. Saul being a, a religious zealot and a persecutor of the church that has this incredible encounter with Jesus. So these guys are all together, and it says there were certain prophets and teachers. So you wonder what gifts they were exercising. You wonder the things that they would have been praying about. But I want you to see verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord... And fasted. What in the world does that mean to minister to the Lord? So we talk about ministering as if unto the Lord, you know, serve as if you're serving Jesus. Worshiping. Huh. That that would fall in there, I would think. You know, I think we saw some of that this morning. I, I'll tell you guys, though, um, Ministering to the Lord is something that we should all be doing. I mean, it's easy to say, wow, you know what, what the group just led us in up here. That, that clearly is ministering to the Lord. We're singing praises to his name. And, and all of us joined into that wonderful choir. You know, hearing you guys this morning, I, I almost started to leak. You know, it was nice that you guys were getting worship. Um. Ministering to the Lord means doing what pleases him, what honors him. What, so, so worship, praise, prayer. What about what we're doing now? Listening to him, you know, learning from his word, 
to honor God. All of those things minister under God. And that's one of the things that we've tried to um, teach and instruct. Anybody that serves here, this should be their first thing. We've got a, some lists in that closet over there for our deacons and different servants of things that have to be done. You know, and, and checklists so things don't get forgotten. And we've tried all kinds of different things over the years so that, you know, I don't come in the next morning or, or the next night and see that the heat's left on and this is left on. And we've had different levels of success with our check sheets. And for a season, we had these, they were printed out with the ability to just sign them and stick them in the offering box. Not so daddy could be a probation officer and check and make sure you did everything. Didn't even review them, but wanted to teach that heart that we are doing this for Jesus. This is part of our offering, our response of love back to him. And, you know, there's a piece of that. I don't want to call my girl out, but how many of you guys remember when Susan first started being involved in the worship team? Remember, we, the band would play and we'd give her an opportunity to sing along with somebody else or get, get up here and she'd be playing the keyboards right along and be right up here until it was her time to sing and she'd be like back here or this or that. And I remember her mother getting so frustrated with her one day saying, if you don't get in that mic, you're not getting up on that stage anymore. And I, I corrected her, you're not the boss around here, you know. <laughs> but... Remember, I'm tired. <laughs> I know I'm going to pay for that. But anyways, where were we? Acts? But I want to point something out. God called that young lady to a ministry. To minister to him. But along with that, she's worked harder than most people I know. God gives us gifts and God gives us callings. And with those callings, God equips us along the way. You know, he's given her certain opportunities that... Um, maybe I've never had, you know, I've never had voice instructors. I've never gone to college for music. Not that I need to tell you that. Um, but she's been diligent about work and, and putting in the effort and, and learning and improving to use those gifts for the Lord. And we see this huge transition that's occurred in those gifts. Turn somewhere else with me for a second to, uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Keep a thumb in Acts because we might get back there. Verse uh, 20... Verse 25, you guys have all heard that. You've heard it from here several times. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Right? Don't skip church. Make sure we show up. All of that. The verse before that says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching, friends. And it's so much more important that we do these things, that we gather here corporately, gather in smaller settings, um, independently, and lift each other up. The, the, the whole idea of um, stirring up good works, spreading love with one another. You know, that's her gift ministers to the Lord, but her gift can minister to all of us. And so can yours. You know, God has called you to, uh, to a work. These guys got it. They ministered to the Lord first and fasted. So when, when we're fasting, prayer goes along with that. And I wonder when, when this church is gathered and these leaders in this church have gathered that have the gift of prophecy and have the gift of, of teaching, what kinds of things do you think they might have been praying about. Any ideas? The answer's not in there. It's, it's kind of speculation, some assumption. I'm just trying to see who read ahead. No. What's that? Who to send out? Brown knows who read ahead. No. 
Yeah, I mean, very likely, right? If you've got prophets speaking forth the word of God, I'm sorry, brother, I love you. <laughs> Do you want to come up here? <laughs> very likely. They, they have the gift of prophecy. They have the gift of speaking forth the word of God. So their heart, their passion, everything, like, like this gifting that's given her, she wants to use that. They want to use that gift to honor the Lord, to minister unto the Lord. So, Lord, how are we going to do that? How are we going to speak forth the word of God? God, you've given us the, the, the gifting of teaching, and we want to use that and exercise that. Give us places to go. Very likely, things that they were praying about. So they ministered to the Lord, they fasted, and then while they were ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke. The Holy Spirit gave instruction. They're ministering to the Lord, they're praying, they're fasting, and while they were doing that, the Holy Spirit gives them direction. Now, as we see oftentimes, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Anybody ever experienced that? You, you see a need. You identify, this ought to be happening. And, and you begin to pray. And Maybe you go to your pastor or go to somebody and say, hey, I've, I've, I've identified this need. And, and if you've come to me, you might say, huh, God laid that on your heart. Huh? You see that there's a need here. You've been praying about that, huh? You know, and then usually it clicks or, or the Lord speaks and you end up being the very one to minister in that area. I love how God answers prayer like that. You know, you say, God, I see this incredible need. And God says, yeah, so do I. So get to work. You know, get to work. That's not an unusual occurrence. It's so often the ones that have the heart to pray about an issue are the same ones that God uses to minister to that particular need. Remember, one of the, one of the most essential benefits of prayer is aligning our will with God's will. You know, so God identifies this need, places that in your heart through the Holy Spirit, and you begin to pray, and through that process of praying about that need, God equips you to meet that need. One of the, one of the very first things that I do when a, when a need is identified around here is I, Sunday morning, look who's in the prayer room. You know, who's seeking the Lord on those things, who's, who's in there diligently interceding on your behalf, you know, and on the behalf of the needs in the church, who's, who's more aware of what the Holy Spirit is doing and, and moving the direction of the church. And it, it should never, never be the opposite of that, you know, that you're given a position or, or put in a place so that now you're in prayer meeting, or now you're, the expectations are that you'll be doing certain things. Um, they ministered to the Lord. They fasted. The Holy Spirit speaks. Now, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So the Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit gives direction, a confirmation of a previous call. Right back in chapter 9, um, Jesus was speaking to Ananias prior, prior to him baptizing Saul. Acts chapter 9, verse 15 says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Speaking of Saul of Tarsus that Ananias was scared to death of. Go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So back in chapter 9, Saul gets this call. This call to ministry. And he said, this is what will happen. He's a chosen vessel of mine. And he's going he's gonna to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he's going to speak before kings and the children of Israel. But there's no time frame. There's no commission to go do it today. But back in verse 2, we see that. The Holy Spirit said, now. 
Now's the time. Separate these guys. And, and one of the things that I find interesting about this is this church is going and it's a powerful ministry and you've got all these guys that are leadership and prophets and teachers and the church is gathering and Saul and Barnabas have this, you know, they're probably the two best speakers there. Certainly leaders among the leaders. And then the Holy Spirit says, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Separate these two guys. You know, we're, we're called to that same thing. We, we talk about being sanctified or be set apart, but I want you to understand too, when he says separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, when we separate ourselves to the work of the Lord, we also have to remove ourselves from certain other things. Right? When we're called to go, we have to leave. When we're, when we're called to be separated to God. Sometimes there's other things in our life that we have to remove. So they get the time frame. Um, do it now. Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. Anybody find that interesting? They're ministering to the Spirit. They're praying and fasting. And then the Holy Spirit speaks. And then they do it again. You know, or the church does it at this point. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them. Not, not some kind of magic formula, you know, but they lay hands on them, recognizing this is a work that the Lord is doing, and we're in partnership with them, and, and we're sending them away. And this is unique. We haven't seen this yet in the early church. Like I said, we've seen the Christians spread, basically in terror and fleeing persecution, but this is brand new that, that people are being sent out for the work of the, the ministry, for, for the purpose of missions. So they fast and they pray, almost, I, I think, confirming this call. The Holy Spirit spoke. You know what? This is, we were praying for this thing, and the Holy Spirit speaks, and was this just us? You know, because we wanted to hear this? Did we hear it? And there's no indication here in our text either that the Holy Spirit spoke in a big calm, booming voice. It does say that the Holy Spirit said. Now, how the Holy Spirit said it, I, I don't know. Very likely, who do we have here? We've got people with a gift of prophecy. Very likely could have used those gifts in the church to speak forth the will of God to them. Very likely it was prophecy. It could have been an inner voice of the Holy Spirit saying, now's the time, guys. You know that you've had this call. It's been identified and, and now you need to go. So the church, was this me? Is this crazy? Am I hearing this right? They fasted and prayed and got confirmation. Then they laid hands on them and they sent them away. And I think that is so important. You know, a lot of the missionary groups talk about the difference. Some were sent and some just went. You know, there's a huge difference. So it's very important. The church lays hands on them, kind of commissions them for ministry, sends them away. And then we see something very important in verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? We just saw the church laid hands on them and sent them out, which is cool. But we find out that they're really sent out by the Holy Spirit, which is profitable which will make their ministry fruitful. Because we can send people out all over the place. And if it's not a work of the Holy Spirit, they're coming back. <laughs> you know, or, or their ministry won't be fruitful there. So they confirm it with praying and fasting. They, they lay hands on them, commissioning them. We're in partnership with these guys. We believe that the Holy Spirit is doing this. And we get confirmation in verse 4 that they were, in fact, sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. For those of you that like visuals. Okay, can you see Antioch? I should have a pointer. But Antioch, way over to the far right-hand side of your screens. That's where this church is. And then they go down to Seleucia, it says. And what happens in Seleucia? What's that? Why are we laughing? What I say now? Yeah, there are. There actually are. I mean, there really is. The, the one up top is like modern-day Turkey area. There's actually way more than two Antiochs. So 
again, because repetition is a good teacher, the Antioch to your far right is where this church was. And they went down to Seleucia, 15 or 20 miles. Okay, we've got no indication here that like miraculous things happened. Really, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So like why it's even mentioned, I don't know, other than anybody ever been on a mission trip, short-term mission trip, anything like that? And did you journal when you went? I've looked back at when I went to Honduras, and it's like we went to the airport. It's like no relevant, but so excited about what was going on. And I think that's kind of, they went to Seleucia. And then from there, did you see the big island there in the middle, Cyprus? Yeah, you with me? Okay. I, I thought you guys would dig this, but oh, how do you like that? So they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, that big island there. And then we see... When they arrived in Salimus, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they also had John as their assistant. John, John Mark, Barnabas' nephew. If you look back to Acts chapter 12, the very end of that, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, where they had fulfilled their ministry. Remember, they collected this offering, delivered that to Jerusalem. So they're returning from Jerusalem. They fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. By the way, the same um, Mark that wrote the, the first gospel of Mark. I know they don't go in that order, but chronologically, that guy. But he's just Barnabas' kid nephew. And what I love about chapter 12, verse 25, Barnabas and Saul are doing the work of the ministry. And they took with them John, whose surname is Mark. You'll probably be hearing more of this in the weeks and months to come. Just because that is so much my heart for discipleship at this church. That everything that we're doing, I've talked about it for years, about discipleship going from top to bottom. But like, this is really what I want to see lived out here. If you're doing ministry here, if you're serving in a role, have somebody in your hip pocket or right with you. Hey, come with me and just watch as I do this. Do this with me. And work alongside. That way we're training and equipping, stirring up good works and love in one another. But rather than just sit down with a check sheet, okay, here's how you do this. Come follow me. Do this. So that's what they do. And then we see as a result of that, John Mark just traveling with them. Now he's with them on a missions trip. You know, God's growing that kid up. So they go down to Seleucia. From there, they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived in Salimus, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. Not a, not a glorious role, you know? He was an assistant, but he was there making the work of the ministry possible. So these guys, just again, for perspective, they've, they've gone down and again, far right of that island now, Salimus. And then what did we read that they did when they got there? Verse, verse 5, when they arrived in Salimus, they, they did what? They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And what happened? How many people got saved? It really just doesn't say. But they did it. You ever, you ever share your faith with someone or share the good news of the gospel? I know you guys can't appreciate this, but you ever get the opportunity to get up in front of a congregation and preach, and you're so excited about what you're going to share, and you've prayed over it, God, for this point in time, and these people, what is it that you have to say, and, and help them to get it, and you look out, and there's like five people sleeping. <laughs> or, you know what? This gifting. It is so easy to go down to Gordon College and lead worship and have 1,200 or 1,500 kids singing like crazy, and you're leading that wonderful praise, and then come here and have like 20 out of 100 people singing and get frustrated or, or be tempted to manufacture a response or how do I get them to respond or how do I get them to worship? I mean, and if you're preaching, how do I get them to wake up? you know, without throwing something at them? Or, or how do I get them to get, get it? Anybody ever been frustrated by that? 
Sharing your faith with, faith with a, a family member, maybe? Let me kind of relieve you of some pressure. Like, the response isn't your job. I see people fighting now. I can't go back to sleep. <laughs> our response is to be obedient and, and share, you know, and be bold in our faith. That's our job. The response, that's on the Holy Spirit. That's up to God. You know, I felt incredible pressure of, I know this person desperately needs Jesus, and I'm going to hammer them with it until they do. And th there's an old story. I, don't, I honestly don't know that it's true. There's really no reason for me not to believe, but it's an old preacher's story about um, a church gathering that Billy Graham was speaking at. And this old drunk guy comes stumbling in there, highly intoxicated, and at the end of the service, he goes up to Billy Graham and he says, oh, oh, it's Billy Graham. You saved me 10 years ago. And he said, oh, I, I probably did, but clearly you're not saved by Jesus or something to that effect. I'm sure Billy didn't judge his salvation, but it was something to the, that effect. And guys, if, if we try to manufacture a response, we got to maintain that response and all that. But that's up to the Holy Spirit. These guys go and there's no indication that anything happened. There's no indication that anyone got saved. But this became their practice. You guys, they're going into Jewish synagogues. And when, it, when a man of stature, like Saul, right, part of the Sanhedrin would come in, they were distinguished in some way. And I don't know if it was by reputation or if it was by dress. You know, I know there were particular things that they wore or styles. Very, very similar as if um, we're gathered here today for church and one of the other Calvary pastors in Maine came in. Or you're gathered in a, in a different setting, and you see somebody come in in a clerical collar, and you know that they're some type of minister or a priest, and, and you see this visiting pastor, and you say, hey, would, you, would you like to come up and say anything? You know, and I, I, that was what Saul and Barnabas did. That was the first thing they would do, is go to the local synagogue, right, and have the opportunity to teach, and they'd be there, and I, I don't know how it went, but Saul probably be like, hey, wait, they're going to ask me, watch. You know, and this was something that they would do. And they'd say, oh, Saul's here. Do you, do you want to have the opportunity to teach or to share something? And he, he would go to the Old Testament scriptures and speak of the Messiah. You know, so they, they go and they're here, but we don't have a record of any huge response. But they speak the word of God in the synagogue to the Jews, and they had John Mark with them as their assistant. Why Salimus? Anybody have any idea? It's interesting because we got this direction from the Lord, go now and be sent out. And then they go to this place and like, why here first? We, we know from earlier in the scriptures that Barnabas was actually from Cyprus. You know, pro so very likely could have been, hey, we got this call from the Lord. It's been confirmed. You know, hey, I'm from there. There's people that desperately need Jesus there. You know, and, and so that was the first place that they went. And it was home for him. And, and I love, I'm guessing that it was done without a demographic study or committee meetings and plan. I'm not saying that stuff it, by my tone. I'm not saying that it's not profitable, you know, but I, I know several denominations that do that. And, and even Paul's practice going forward was to go to these major cities first and then rely on that church to kind of spread it out. But that's one of the things I love that I've seen within the Calvary Chapel movement is it's not so much where can we go, where can we be successful, but it's where is nobody else there or where do they desperately need Jesus? You know, so these guys go and they, they share there and we don't have record of any big response. They um, also had John as their assistant. Verse, um, does that throw you going right to chapter 12? Okay, that was the thing about John Mark. Verse 6 and 13. Now when they had gone through the island of Pathos, they found a certain sorcerer. So, again, just to... Salimus, they went all the way across the island. I don't know from the text. It says they went through the island um, to Pathos. Wow, look at that kid back there. Can you put the air in his awesome slide up? No, no. So they go there. And they could have done it by boat. It doesn't really matter. But they go down there. 
they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, meaning son of Jesus was his name. And we, we might read that today and think, how sacrilegious, how terrible and all that. But I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but the name Jesus was not very unique at the time. You know, not even as much as our Rosaire would be today. So this guy's name was Bar Jesus, or son of Jesus. Verse 7 says, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. Anybody know what a proconsul is? Governor of the region, right, would have reported to Rome. So he was, this was the highest political office. And it's interesting to me that as his consultant, he has a sorcerer. He has this false prophet. I don't want to really wig you out or scare you, but if you study our presidents in this country and some of the advisors that they've had, or even our current one who claims a personal pastor, uh, anyways, they've been advised by some, um, how do I say it without being offensive, charlatan, false prophets, liars, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. What a cool opportunity, right? They obey God. Where are we supposed to go? Well, let's start out going here. And then they go across the island and they have an opportunity to meet the governor of the entire region, an intelligent person that invites them. He wants to hear from God, but he's got this other guy with him, this false prophet, this, this sorcerer, and we'll see in verse 8, but Elimus the sorcerer, for it is his name, for so his name is translated. And I really think this was just Luke saying, I'm not, I'm not calling him son of Jesus. There's no way. Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But this was a threat to him, right? I mean, he's, he's the governor's secret Santa or, or, you know, spiritual advisor. And if he gets saved, if he turns his life to Jesus, he's all done. So he withstood them. He stood in the way of them hearing the truth of the word of God. Tried to, I should say. Seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, Filled with the Holy Spirit. That's important. This wasn't just a reaction from, from Paul. He looked intently at him. And in his cowardly little Christian way, said this. And said, verse 10, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. What do you think? Let's forget all about the video and, and recording and all that. I want, what do you think about that response? You've got the governor, say, of our state, or the president, and they've got their spiritual advisor with them, and they have asked to hear the good news of God. And you begin to tell them about God loves you so much that he became man and came on this earth and lived a perfect, sinless life and paid a price by his death on the cross that you could never, ever pay. No animal blood could cover it. No, no sacrifice would be enough except the sinless son of God. And he loves you, crazy about you, and this guy butts in, and he tries to pull him away. How would you respond? I, I, I'd be nervous. Hopefully, you'd be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I got something here. Acts chapter 13, let me read this to you. <laughs> Didn't exist then, though. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. What? So that answers part of it. That's why there was the boldness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. But what an extreme reaction. You know, I mean, wouldn't you kind of be like, hold, hold on, man, because you want to witness to him too, right? Just go ahead, you speak your turn and let me have mine. 
The stakes are so high here. Paul knew this pro counsels eternity. The Holy Spirit prompted his heart. He's seeking the truth. And now you have this opportunity and his salvation forever and ever. The difference between heaven and hell is on the line. And Paul knew it. And this guy's getting in the way. You know what the Lord says? If, if one of you stands in the way of one of my children coming to me, be better off what? Millstone around your neck, drowned in the sea. Stakes are pretty high when the Lord considers his children or those that he's calling to him. And Paul knew that. And filled with the Holy Spirit, this was his response. One of the things I appreciate about this church is, I don't want to necessarily be, say being able to speak this way, but being able to speak the truth in love, being able to say the a harsh thing at times. And I appreciate that you guys have such a relationship with the Lord that you desire that. I desire that. You know, if I'm wrong or, or you see things in my life that aren't right or you see pride starting to rise up in ways that I'm not seeing, that you'd bring it to my attention for the sake of the Lord Jesus, for the sake of the ministry. You know, I appreciate that. But this right here, this is something that the Lord um, takes seriously. So, Anybody here, anybody listening online, if you're in that role, you don't have to be a sorcerer. You don't have to be the son of the devil as he describes it here. But are you in a position in your marriage or in a relationship with somebody else or in your family where you're keeping somebody from the Lord or hindering their relationship with the Lord? That is a big deal, guys. The Lord takes that seriously. If you would stand in the way of somebody else. God bless those kids. I love them so much. That's not the devil using them right now. And don't let it be a distraction. If, if you're the one that needs to hear that. If you know that the way that you're living your life, you are a hindrance to somebody else. And you, you're just standing in the way. Because you know if they turn to Jesus, it's going to change your relationship. get that it's a big deal. But if it's a big deal to not stand in the way of their relationship with God, then, then you, you can do that with them. Get yourself right with God. Then you're not a hindrance. O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. What do you think about that part of it? Calling them out. And you're going to be blind. Don't you wish we could do that? Kind of. I smooch you. Another story I heard this week. Um, a long time ago, 25 years ago, at least now, a pastor that was a big church, a good church, and there was protesters outside the church. It doesn't matter what the issue was, but this pastor tried to be a godly man and just respond in love and all that. But the PW at that church, the pastor's wife, went out and, and, and went to that crowd and found the biggest, burliest guy there. And she got right up. What does this say back here in verse 9? Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, got in his face. Well, this pastor's wife picked out the biggest, burliest guy in that group and got in his face. And she said, in the name of God, I put a curse on you until you repent of all this. And we shouldn't be cursing people. Well, that's not what I'm endorsing. And walked away. And by the end of that week, that big burly guy was calling that church and saying, hey, I don't know who that lady was, but could you, could you ask her to take this curse off? Because my life has gone crazy all week. <laughs> I think it was just conviction of the Holy Spirit. Hey guys, sometimes this is actually easier when we get met with the enemy face to face and you see it. 
than when we're side by side with a brother or sister and we're seeing things in their life after we take that stick out of our own eye. But you see things that are hindering them in their relationship with the Lord to come alongside and say, brother, sister, I love you. And, and like it says in, in the scriptures, to restore them gently, to show them in the word what's going on and have the boldness through the Holy Spirit to do that. So verse 13. Actually, you know what? I just want to say about that too. Do you think that was like Paul just being furious and angry? And I'm going to strike you blind. Do you remember I, I said well-intended religious zealot when Saul of Tarsus is persecuting the Christians and he has this encounter with Jesus? What happened to him? He was blinded, right? Scales come over his eyes and he can't see to show him that he was blinded and couldn't see. You know, so I'm not sure that this wasn't just a graceful, merciful heart of Paul. And saying, you know what, God, you, you're, you're full of deceit and fraud. Right now you're being a son of the devil and you don't even see it. So like God did with me, I'm going to show you that you can't see. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. So the intent wasn't just to strike him or maim him or take his sight away, but that this would be for a season and that the Lord would show him the light. And immediately... A dark mist fell on him, and he went all around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Sound familiar? Saul of Tarsus needed somebody to lead him in, into um, the city. Then the proconsul believed. Man, thank God Paul went to battle. The, the, the result of this was the governor believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Catch that last part. He just saw Saul stand up to this guy in his presence, which would have been amazing. You know, probably nobody ever had the courage to do anything like that. And then he sees this guy lose his sight. And I'd be flipping out over that if a man said, you shall be blind. And all of a sudden they were blind. But he says he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Right? All those things happen. But what astonished this man was the teaching of the Lord. What astonished this man was that God actually loved him. That God cared enough about him to send his son. That God cared enough to him when, when he's on this island of Cyprus to send these two guys to him. He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Verse 13, and, and a lot of people break this up and stop at 12, but I just, I want to look at this. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Pathos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. You guys need to see the map? I'm going to entertain those that are awake. You can see the map. So, now Paul and his party set from Pathos. See that? The bottom of Cyprus. There you go. And they came to Perga, north. in Pamphylia, that region. Um, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. What do you guys know about that? John departed from them. This is kind of a critical time. This is right in the middle of the first missionary journey. And we'll see in like chapter 15 that Paul was not really impressed with this. Paul was not really happy. This guy that was kind of in their hip pocket, right? Coming back from Jerusalem and he's in training and then he becomes an assistant and God's using him. And they, right in the middle of it, he's valuable to them and he departs. He bails. There's all kinds of speculation as to why. You know, some of it even is, see in verse 13, it says, now when Paul and his party set sail, we read right over that and we think, yeah, that's natural. And then this is, we even call this Paul's first missionary journey. Up until this point, it's Barnabas and Paul, you know, or all these guys. So God has done something, this transition here in leadership too. And who was, who was John? 
He's Barnabas' nephew, right? So it could have just been as simple as, hey, my uncle's not in charge anymore. It's this crazy dude, Saul. I'm out of here. Have you ever been put in a position where you're serving under somebody that is tough to serve under? <laughs> there are way too many nodding heads among the leadership. <laughs> well, good thing the camera's this way and not that way. Yeah. That can be tough. That's why we're ministering. That's the primary reason. One of, one of the primary re reasons we're ministering unto the Lord and not to people. We're ministering to people as we minister to the Lord. Can anybody, anybody give an amen? And I'm not really soliciting this, but this sometimes ministering to people are hard. That sometimes they're unappreciative. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> I could be here all day. That's why we serve Jesus. You, know, you will never be taken advantage of by Jesus. You will never be burned by Jesus. Jesus doesn't miss it when you do something. This morning when I was calling guys and saying, hey, the, the cleaning company didn't come. Can you please clean the toilets before the service? If they were serving Brian instead of Jesus... I would have had to make more than one phone call or, or, you know. So blessed by you guys. John Bales. Some, some speculate, so maybe the uncle thing. His mom was in Jerusalem. His mom was a prominent figure in the church there, had the prayer meetings in her home. And he very, very likely could have said, man, my mom is a prayer warrior and she's doing this and hosting this. But this now, this is hard. Being out here with this opposition and, and doing all this, this is, I want to go back and be a prayer warrior, you know, or, or I want to be behind the scenes in the ministry and not actually out there doing the ministry. I wonder how Barnabas felt that now it was Paul and his party. Don't mistake or believe. You know, even when we're serving under somebody that's difficult, that that's something that God's not aware of. David writes in Psalm 75, 7, and I'll end with this. God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. Sometimes that's a tough sermon to hear, sermon to live. God's doing something here. We'll see. Actually, I don't, I don't want to spoil alert. Chapter 15, we kind of hear Paul's heart concerning John. They're going to another missionary journey, and Barnabas says, hey, let's grab John. And Saul, Paul says, and Paul, Saul is known as Paul from here on out, okay? Whew. Paul says, no way. He bailed on us before when we needed him. No way. But then when you look at the very end, we see God restored that relationship. And Paul says, hey, send John Mark to me. He's, he's profitable to me. He's a, he's a good servant of the Lord. So a lot to think about in this today. And I'll let the Holy Spirit sort it out for you. Let's just pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the examples in this, Lord, of taking uh, young people alongside of us, young people in age or young people in, in the faith, Lord, and watching um, as, as others serve and learning how to do those things and exercising our gifts and callings, Lord, there's, there's a sermon in that. There's a sermon in, in being bold and being filled with the Holy Spirit and seeking you and praying and fasting to be sure that, it's, that we are being sent, Lord, and we weren't one that just went but we're following your call on our lives. Lord, the difficulty of being, um, having a change in leadership, Lord, or serving under people, Lord, help us to always remember that it's you that we're ministering to first above all else. And Lord, thank you that you know our name. Thank you that you love us, that you sent your son, that you don't just save governors, Lord, but you save us. 
Father, give us opportunity this week to do these very things, to boldly share the good news about your son, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.